All right. Well, we are so happy that you're with us right now. And uh, we called this managing the mayhem because that's what many people have been feeling it it feels like is, is mayhem. And I think I spent the last two days on the phone, on email, on messages, really just trying to talk to people about how this is feeling, how are people navigating. And the biggest word that we heard was the word uncertainty. People are feeling really uncertain and uneasy. There's been a lot of changes, a lot of shifts in the last uh, few days, bringing our kids home, having to figure out what work looks like, having to figure out what home looks like. It is a lot. And so we really want to dive into what it looks like to manage all of this. And we're probably not going to get to everything. We're not going to solve the world's problems in an hour, but we do want to walk alongside of you. And we are doing this. We're putting business on hold uh, just right now to come along and walk alongside of you. And for the next few Wednesdays, four Wednesdays, we are going to be doing this free webinar every Wednesday at noon, Mountain Central Time, Mountain Standard Time, uh, just to really walk these things through. So if there's something that we didn't talk about today that you would love us to talk about, please um, email me. You probably have my email by now. I've messaged every single one that's registered personally, just to let you know that we are really standing with you in this time. And so um, a couple of the things that came up, let's just uh, say what we were going to uh, chat about was managing your mental health in the midst of a public health crisis. Abe, how do we manage our mental health in the midst of all of this? Yeah, like, uh, I guess the first thing I want to say is uh, we're going to be treating this, Connie and I, kind of like a conversation. And uh, again, in terms of either using the chat box or the... Uh, question and answer box. We really want to hear from you. Engagement is so important. I can promise you uh, that I'm not an expert. Um, and <laughs> maybe that's the wrong way to start a webinar. I can promise you that, you know, Connie's not an expert. In other words, we really think that uh, the challenges we're facing right now are pretty complex. I don't know anyone living, um, you know, at the management level who's been through something like this at this scale. Uh, I'm sure they went through it uh, during uh, the flu in 1918, but um, you know, I don't think anyone is is still in management who may have served at that time. So this is this is unprecedented. Um, you know, I think when when you talk about managing your mental health in the midst of a public health crisis, the first thing that comes to my mind is the idea that there's controllables and then there's non-controllables. And um, you know, at the best of times, managing your mental health is about understanding controllables versus non-controllables. But in this, one of the most challenging times in our history, and it's global, um, and, and, and there's so much that's outside of the scope of our control. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's really challenging for people. And so, you know, it's, it's kind of like understanding what's outside of your zone of control, but finding some autonomy and some empowerment by managing the things that you can. And I, I hope that that is something that some of you have been thinking about because, uh, you know, in, in roles of management even, you know, our, our employees will look at us as, as if somehow we have control. Wouldn't that be nice, right? Um, but for any of you in a leadership role right now, you know that, that you have just as many questions as, as they do, uh, and maybe even more. And so it's really tough, you know? So, so I don't know, what, what are your thoughts about that, Connie? The idea of controlling uh, the controllables and, 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 and sort of allowing the non-controllables to take on uh, what they're gonna be, because what they're gonna be is what they're gonna be, right? Yeah, I think that there's a lot of uh, mental wellness that can come to our mind when we, when we just embrace the fact that right now, a lot of people don't have a lot of answers. And, there's always something that we do have control over. And of course, number one, that's ourselves. We control ourselves. We can control our schedule. I would say one of the greatest things that, that I've learned, because we've walked our family through crisis, this feels no different for us actually than what we've walked through in the past, other than it's a global pandemic. But honestly, there's always something you can control and always think about coming back to ground zero. What is really the most important commodity we have right now. 
Well, that's our human relationships. That's our family. We got to take care of our family. We have to create a structure for our homes and our work life. Um, and we kind of have to go back to square zero on that with um, thinking about what does my day look like? If I have children at home, uh, which I do, and you might even hear them because I've been telling them to keep it down, but you know, they're kids. I have to do most of my work between 5 a.m. And, and 8 a.m. right now if I want sanity, if I want to get stuff done. That's just an adjustment I've had to make. Um, we, you might have to think about what does your daily schedule look like? How are you going to keep yourself healthy? How are you going to get enough sleep in there? We'll talk about that more later. But your daily schedule, you have 100% control over that right now. And that's going to give you sanity. And to make sure that we're cultivating um, relationships and open conversations with um, our families, with our employees, with the people we work with. How are you doing? And really allowing people to talk. Right now, don't underestimate how much uh, listening can make people feel a little bit more in control and a little bit more relaxed over their mental health. Yeah, I would agree with that. And, and uh, I'd love to hear some, uh, you know, folks uh, just in the chat screen, give us your thoughts about this, you know, how, 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 how are we managing, right? I mean, I think for, for all of us in these times, the, one of the critical keys is this also this idea of going back to basics. And, uh, you know, with, uh, again, you know, if you think about controlling the controllables, um, that's sort of the first thing. But secondly, you know, what are the basics for your mental health? I mean, when, when I think about my mental health, which, you know, I've, I, I don't mind admitting, I've had challenges over the years. And, uh, and so I'm really empathetic. I've had challenges uh, on, on a couple of levels when it comes to mental health. And, and for me, there's some, some grounding exercises that are really helpful. Um, you know, to be honest, I'm, I, I, I love to run and uh, I don't share that to say that that's the answer <laughs> uh, for everybody because I get it. It's not, but I know for myself, there's something about, I mean, I can run in a gym on a treadmill, but there's just something different. And I, it doesn't matter to me if it's minus 30 or plus 30. Uh, I, I just find that when I need a reset, I need to put on the running shoes. And, uh, you know, I, I think for all of you on this, um, uh, on this call right now, there's, there's, there's probably ways that you're able to reset and reboot. And, um, and, 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 and a lot of it has to do, I think, with exercise, nutrition, uh, knowing how to pull yourself away. Uh, I love what uh, Vanessa is saying here. My team is managing via constant communication, uh, daily webcam, morning meetings, end of day meetings, and lots of chats, video calls throughout the day. That's brilliant, right? So, so it's, you know, I guess it is, yeah, back to basics, you know, keeping in touch, right? In the same way that we would if we didn't have the physical distancing that we need right now. Um, you know, you're, you're, it sounds like, Vanessa, keeping in touch with your team, and I think that's brilliant. So thanks for sharing that. Mm -hmm. No, that's really, really good. And honestly, I know that it sounds really elementary. Some of these things you think, well, there's got to be something else. Well, no, this is, this is the basics. And coming back to the basics is important. And I think that giving yourself a lot of grace right now, giving yourself a lot of grace to feel, a lot of grace to, to rest. Um, this is a big life um, adjustment for so many. And they say that we can only handle so many traumas. In, in our life at one time. This is one massive trauma in some ways. Um, I don't wanna cause trauma by saying that, but I also want to call to the attention that you're going through something that's a big deal. And to really listen to your body, um, listen to what your family is saying, just really be present and aware. Yeah. Don't underestimate the power of that. There's no um, special magic formula right now other than to really keep it simple. I would say. So yeah, that's great. Love it. Love it. And, and, you know, I think uh, I love what you said, Connie, about, about um, giving yourself grace. You know, the, the truth of the matter is that we're all going to need to do that. And, and some of us who don't like asking for help are probably also going to have to do that a little bit too, because I'm not sure we're going to be able to get through this as sort of solo operators. And so kind of, I guess that takes us to our next topic here which is the idea of finding supports in the right places. And, um, you know, uh, I, I mean, I, I'd, I'd love to just give this to, to Connie 
to start with, because I think Connie is so expert at cultivating relationships and, you know, taking, you know, the, the talents and the gifts that she obviously has, but, but not just solely relying on those, finding a network and a community of support. And, uh, and I can tell you, it's, I don't think it's, it's, it's ever been needed more than it is today. So maybe talk to us a little bit about that, Connie. Sure. Well, of course, connection is powerful. And I think we're, I think we're discovering through all of this how important connection really is. I mean, we've been liking this on Instagram forever. We've been reading Brene Brown forever. And now we get to live it. Um, but what does it really mean? look like um, to connect, especially in a time when we're, we're having to connect this way. Um, finding the right supports, I think right now, um, it's really important to stay clear of, of, of any kind of toxicity. If you're finding um, online, especially scrolling through social media, I mean, it's doomsday on social media right now. If you scroll there too long, I think staying away from, from connection online that might cause you to fear, that's really never a great, great thing. Um, it's, it's so important to lean into the people who you feel um, have uh, strength for you right now. I, I know I was thinking this morning about being an anchor for my kids, being, being the anchor. They need to know when they look at me, when they look at you, um, when, when our employees look at us, they're looking like, who's the strong one here? Who's, where's the anchor? And I thought, well, who's my anchor? Well, I know who my anchor is. Um, I, I have a grounding um, that, that I, I could talk about another time. But honestly, we, we have to find our grounding um, in something so that we can be a grounding for others. And um, if people are shaky for us, I mean, we need to listen. We need to bring people who are hurting closer to us right now, but just really drown out um, any kind of fear, drown those things out and fill yourself with people who, who are going to feed your hope right now, because hope is powerful. Hope is the, uh, one of the greatest commodities we have at this moment. And there, if, if you get with people who think hopeful, not, not uh, optimism to the, to the degree that they're in denial of what's happening, but hope in, in the sense that we are creative and we will get through this. Um, that's important. And that's why I like Abe. I like working with Abe because he's always thinking about how do we creatively move forward. And I want to remind you that you are creative. That yes, uh, we're figuring out a couple of bumps. What are we, day three into this? Um, I mean, it's longer, but day three at home, we're going to figure this out because to be human is to be creative. So that's, that's what I would say. And I like what Dawn said here, practicing the steps of confirming news is always a good idea regarding the situation. Yeah, I think that's brilliant. Thanks so, so much for that, Dawn. And, uh, and also Christelle for your comments. Um, you know, Matthew was asking a question, Connie, about compounding trauma and how everything uh, adds together, like you were saying. And, uh, you know, he, he goes on and says, sometimes this whole process with COVID-19 feels so surreal that it's hard to see the trauma in it. And what are the ways that we can develop empathy for the situation so that we can have grace for ourselves and those around us? So um, do you want to take a run at that, Connie? Yeah. Um, so I, I'm not sure where that question is from Matthew. Um, it's on the question and answer. Sorry to, yeah. Oh, jump I see. Yeah. Right here. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, we really have to listen to like these things. We, we can so easily dismiss them. Compounding trauma. I mean, before all of this hit the fan, I mean, how were you mentally? How were you mentally already? Um, I, I, I like to um, give an analogy of some people are hanging on by a rope. Um, everybody's resilience is so different. And based on what's going on in your life, I mean, if you're having family trauma, if you're having um, things that are, are, are really weakening you at the moment, I mean, some people have a very large rope that they can hang on. And you think, how does that person overcome so much? And then you have people who maybe through life experiences or just through constant um, uh, things coming at them, they're hanging on by a thin thread. And all it takes is just one little bump, let alone a pandemic, to break that string. And so compounding traumas, really thinking about what has your last five years been like? 
What has your last year been like? I mean, so many people said 2019 was the worst year of their life. And here we are, 2020. The Body Keeps the Score. One of my favorite books by Dr. Bessel. I can never say his last name, but look it up. Uh, the Body Keeps the Score and your body does store trauma. And I think that the way our culture works with the rat race and just pushing through and uh, I know all this stuff is going on around me, but I'm just going to ignore it. I'm going to suck it up. Well, the time to suck it up is not now because your body, literally, you might even be able to feel it in your body. You want to pay attention because you want to take good care of your health, your physical health right now. Um, I was telling my kids, stay healthy because we don't know if the doctor will be able to see us. We want to take our probiotics. We want to eat healthy. And I'm not saying that out of fear, but we have to take good care of our bodies and pay attention to perhaps not just this trauma, but what's been leading up and take care of those things. Start to notice them. Start to do the, the deep work inside. Now's a great time to do it because we're all on pause. So that was really, really good, uh, Connie. And thanks so much for sharing that. You know, I'm, uh, I'm really grateful. And I think it's, it's critical keys. The body keeps the score. And, um, you know, one of the other questions in the, in the, in the chat box, or sorry, in the, in the question here, uh, you know, and I'm just going to bring it up, you know, and it's a great question from Bob says, great advice, uh, Connie, about being selective regarding social media. Uh, what are your go-to trusted social media sites? And maybe, I'll respond and then see, you know, if you could uh, add anything, Connie, that might be missing. Uh, you know, we, we, we do live in a world where, <clears throat> you know, so much good communication, I think, comes through social media. So it becomes really difficult to, um, to cut yourself off. So I don't recommend that. Um, I, I think, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting because, you know, the, the body's ability to fight disease the immune system is negatively impacted by stress. Uh, you know, as a matter of fact, I've, I've heard that when, when we're stressed, uh, when we're experiencing significant anxiety, our immune system's uh, functionality lowers by anywhere from 60 to 70%, which is just a, a shocking number, right? So, so what I have been encouraging people to do is to really limit their social media intake. You know, the other day I was teaching a class um, and it was a small class, so we were fine. Uh, and it was kind of before schools were canceled. And, um, you know, I held up my phone and I had the Globe and Mail app on, on my phone. And uh, this was scary to me. So I literally held it up in front of the class and you can see this. And as I scrolled down, uh, the, first, the first 20 articles were all about COVID-19. And... Uh, and to me, um, that's overkill. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know if, um, you know, if, if, if you think it is or not, but it was just staggering to me that, uh, you know, I could understand the first five or 10 because we are in a pandemic, but 20 articles. And so people, I think, are, are bombarded. And so what I tell people is check the media once or twice a day. But I was chatting with a couple of folks this week, and they're glued to it 24-7 and they can't sleep. Uh, it's impacting their ability uh, to engage their kids. And I don't know about the rest of you, but I have a five-year-old daughter at home and she doesn't know what's going on. But if all she feels from me as her father is stress and tension and anxiety, uh, I, I can only imagine the long-term impact. So, so I, I mean, I, I, I'm not saying let's bear our head in the sand. Of course not. I tune into the media once or twice a day because I want to know the updates and uh, particularly, you know, I happen to live in Calgary. So what's some um, the public health people saying here and, uh, and of course, nationally, because we're in Canada. But beyond that, I'm, I'm not going to have a diet 24-7 uh, because I'm pretty sure that if I'm, uh, you know, around someone who has the coronavirus and I've been grateful not to be so far, but if, I, if I'm with that person and my immune system is weakened, then all of a sudden the very thing I need to defend me is weakened because of my exposure to things that have stressed me out. And so my encouragement is just to be really selective, you know, like there's other things to do. I don't know about you guys, but I, I love listening to podcasts and reading great books and, and tuning into some videos. And then, yeah, check out the media and see what's uh, going on. So how about you, Connie? What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you, Abe. I 
someone told me um, who works with uh, Alberta Health Services, they said, just please do us a favor and ignore what everybody is saying and just listen to your public service announcements. Um, whatever we're saying, Alberta Health Services, we're the ones who know what's really going on. Listen to us, listen to the government, um, but listen to them. That's what I, that's what I would do. And, and, you know, using social media right now as a way to spread um, some joy, some, some good news. When there's good news, please share it. Please share good news. I love seeing my friends having babies right now. That's really good. Um, and then Laura mentioned, um, I love what Laura has said. Laura works with grief and uh, she sees, uh, I believe loss underpins so much of what we're dealing with. Many are experiencing a loss of safety because of the worries about COVID-19, worries about family and loved one. We're experiencing loss of our routine, the loss of not being able to attend events or play sports or watch sports. Um, acknowledging that we're, uh, we're experiencing loss is, is powerful. I think the acknowledgement is, is huge. That's really good. And then Abe, I know um, a big passion of yours uh, right now and mine as well, but uh, I've heard you speak to this and have really enjoyed what you've had to say about um, physical distancing versus social distancing. Yeah, uh, so, uh, sorry, hang on. Uh, okay, you got me there. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that. You know, so obviously, again, um, I'm no expert. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm not a public health official by any means. And so uh, my, my advice is to listen to them over me. But there's been so much overwhelming conversation about this idea of social distancing. And, uh, you know, when, uh, for some of you know, in my career, you know, I spent uh, uh, seven years as the director of programs at the Calgary Drop-In Center. And then uh, after that, I was the executive director of In From The Cold. And, uh, you know, in, in a lot of ways, the reason I share that is as we spend time with our clients, and these are large agencies that work with the homeless population in Calgary, we found that the primary, or if not the, uh, at least one of the top two or three reasons people ended up homeless was because of social distancing. <laughs> you know, in other words, they they for mental health addiction uh sometimes bad behavior i mean who knows but they had had pulled themselves away and i i think what what the public health people mean to say isn't so much social distancing but but physical distancing in other words absolutely um you know people who are traveling people who have uh returned from international flights or you know frankly i mean pretty much everybody right now just just stay home you know uh be be smart, be wise, be safe. But let it, what's so important, I think, in, in my view, is getting to a place where we sort of start to say it's not about um, social distancing, but it's about physical distancing and connect, connecting more than ever. And that's why, you know, Connie and I have decided to do this webinar and we're going to keep it going. And I know Connie's doing some other stuff in, in her world and I'm doing some other stuff in mine because. I just think that social connections are how we're going to get through this, you know? And, um, you know, I was chatting with a restaurant owner this morning and, and, um, you know, he, he, uh, was, was, was kind of heartbroken over, um, you know, having to make the decision to, uh, lay off his staff. And he, he was talking about, you know, how he's scrambling, trying to find work for people who he knows his own staff are very vulnerable. And we know the federal government's responding and we understand that, there's going to be some sort of uh, supplement for these folks, but you know, uh, we don't, uh, we, we need each other, you know, we need each other. We need empathy. We need compassion. We need, um, you know, to get through this. And so, you know, I think what we've got to do, and, and I love again, what was shared earlier from Vanessa about the idea of in with your staff, with your team, getting on the phone, doing lots of video calls or FaceTime or whatever your team is comfortable with, because, you can't ever give somebody too much support, you know, and, um, and I think, uh, you know, you don't have to be physical to be social. And I think that's a real message right now. And, uh, and so I hope that that, that helps, you know, because we just need to make sure we're not isolating people and not allowing people to feel isolated. Uh, and, and I think that's a real concern of mine. And maybe I'm so concerned because I did spend so much time in, in homelessness and I saw that, you know, mental health, I mean, if, you, if you're listening to this and you have wrestled with mental health, you know 
that mental health causes you to self-isolate. You're, you're, already, you're already doing that. You don't need a public health announcement. Um, and so in the middle of all of that sort of self-isolation that folks who are wrestling with mental health go through, and uh, we know that that's at least 20% of the Canadian population, let's make sure we're not social distancing, but let's make sure we are tapping into uh, you know, physical distancing where needed. I like that. That's really good. I just noticed that Crystal just uh, posted something about checking out a resource called Face COVID, How to Respond Effectively to the Coronavirus by Dr. Russ Harris, author of The Happiness Trap, uses principles of ACT, acceptance, commitment, therapy. Nice. Uh, Crystal, I would love to hear a little bit more about what that looks like. Maybe I'll look it up and send the link to everyone, but thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah. And so, you know, kind of continuing right along, Connie, what about uh, my managers who, who you know, because many on this call, uh, they're either managers or maybe supervisors, or maybe they're just team, not just, but they're team members. And so, you know, how can we support each other in the workplace through this? What are your thoughts about that? Oh, yeah, that's real. We had uh, one of the um, participants that's on here right now had just messaged in. He's a supervisor of a small team who's now working remotely really wants to hear some insights about managing work remotely, balancing work versus personal time and direct deposits for himself and hoping to hear about managing expectations and calming nerves during this time of uncertainty. So we hope to tackle some of that right now. Um, you know, for, I think one of the greatest things that we can do right now in regards to um, managing work versus personal um, especially because right now many of us are working from home, so they're blended, is um, putting out blocks of time, scheduling what your day looks like. I think I've mentioned this before, but really, um, and, and challenging your team to do the same. I mean, it might look a little different. If you have kids at home, it really does change the game. And and I don't know what everyone else's life looks like, but as the mother, you know, the kids often look to the mother, <laughs> for their needs. And so, you know, we are constantly being interrupted uh, for lunch, for scrapes, for whatever. And so balancing the home work life right now and encouraging that in our team is to really think about what's going to work. So one of the things that I know, and I'm just speaking as a mom right now, and I, and I hope that uh, this doesn't, many of you maybe aren't parents, but uh, it, it just applies to everyone. Right now, my most productive time isn't what it used to be. So my most productive time used to be when my kids were in school. Well, that is not, the nine to three right now is not my most productive time. My most productive time right now is between five and 8 a.m. before my kids wake up. And that means that I might rest from one to three. Um, balancing the time, giving people um, the permission to adjust their schedule, giving your employees, giving you um, just permission to create a new, uh, a new rhythm is really going to be so important. Um, demands, you might have to think of your demands. If your employees are saying this isn't working, mm. please listen to them at this time. Um, that they're not, they're not complaining. Um, I'm hoping that most people aren't taking advantage of this. I don't think they would be, but really sit down and figure out, okay, well, if that doesn't work, then what is going to work? Okay, 5 to 8 a.m. sounds great. Or maybe some people will have to work in the evenings when the other spouse is at home, or you just have to really figure out how you're going to chunk your day. And I would really encourage you to, to not just schedule your, your day in detail, like 7 a.m. to 8 a.m., this is what I'm going to do, because what's going to happen is it's going to get disrupted and it's going to frustrate you. So don't feel the need to be so regimented. Think of it as in chunks. 5 to 8, this is my work time. 7 to 7.30, this is my workout time. And if it gets disrupted, I mean, we just have to go with the flow right now. So that is my biggest advice to anyone, making sure that you're doing that, giving your team permission to do that. Um, and I'm sure Abe, you've got lots because Abe has led many teams through apocalyptic natures before. <laughs> That's great. Um, you know, honestly, um, just, just, just be before I get into that, you know, thanks again, Vanessa, brilliant. A tool that I've been using to block my time, she says, this is in the chat panel, is, uh, is journaling. 
I just love that. Uh, you know, Brendan Burchard's High Performance Planner. I've used it myself. I think it's great. Uh, 15 minutes in the morning before I do anything, I organize my day. And then take five minutes in the, in the, in the evening to reflect on your day and think about what you can do to improve the next day. And, and, and I think that a lot of that has to do with kind of this mindfulness approach, right? Where we're not just rolling through life, uh, but we're actually taking a bit of time to plan our day, uh, plan our work, and then work our plan. And then after, evaluate and, and, and hold everything in tension that we're talking about. Be gentle with yourself. Give yourself lots of room. You're not going to be as productive. I caught myself even this morning getting a little frustrated because I wasn't getting as much done as I normally do. And I, I don't know about you, but I'm like that little dog who hears the bell. Um, I love to get things done, check them off my list. And um, I didn't have that sort of internal satisfaction today. And it was frustrating me. And I just had to remind myself, you know what, it's going to be good. But, uh, you know, when I was uh, with the Calgary Drop-In Center, uh, you know, we had to deal with a couple of crises that, that uh, many of you would remember. Uh, some of you maybe not, but I was the director of programs when the Norwalk uh, virus broke out uh, in our, on, our, on our site. And uh, as you can imagine, when you're dealing at those times with about 12 to 1,300 homeless individuals per night, uh, and I, I think at, at the height, about 200 of them were infected uh, with the Norwalk virus. It was, a, it was a real challenge because you're dealing with all of the vulnerable groups. You're talking about women and indigenous and of course elderly, also much of the time physically disabled, mentally uh, challenged as well. And then uh, I'm sure those of you who are in, in Calgary remember the flood of uh, 2013. And uh, I was, again, I was the director of programs when the flood happened. And so we, we had to, if you could imagine, evacuate the largest homeless shelter in Canada at the time and move to the uh, Quality Inn that was in the Northeast. And, um, and we, we, were, we did not make that choice willingly. As many of you remember, the, the mayor, uh, you know, they declared a state of emergency. Everyone was ordered to evacuate the downtown. And so now you had to essentially recreate uh, the largest homeless shelter in Canada on a site that um, you know is not designed for that, uh, and so a couple of things I learned um, in in the sort of uh, supporting the well-being of my team because my team had 200 frontline workers who were in my department, and so you know I had 20 uh, 26 uh, direct reports who were managers, and then under them their team of about 200 staff, and so the first thing and Vanessa already talked about it is constant communication. You know, and, and through that crisis, I mean, I, I did have to put up some boundaries. Um, you know, in, in other words, times I wasn't available to talk, but basically it was kind of like 24 seven just to get people through it. Uh, sometimes it was really complex issues, you know, other times it was just simple questions, but the fact that people knew that we were available, that I was available almost 24 seven really helped. Another thing is this idea of being upfront as a manager about what you can control and what you can't. There's no, uh, there's no value in trying to act as though you have some crystal ball that other people don't have. If you don't know, just say it and uh, let them know, your team, that you're doing everything you can to find the answer. But, you know, let's be honest, with COVID-19, I don't think anyone has the crystal ball or the answers. And you hear a lot of speculation. And that's why I love what Connie said uh, from her contact at Alberta Health Services to listen to the public health people. And, uh, you know, honestly, CNN, Fox News, CBC, CTV, Global, whatever you're into, um, you know what, they, they, their job is to create media content. And so that means you're seeing a ton of speculation on those channels, but when I tune in, to the Alberta Public Officer of Health, Chief Medical Officer, I know I'm getting the straight facts and I have to pay uh, homage because our Chief Medical Officer in Alberta, I think has done a great job of communicating with us. I think the other thing um, is, is wherever you can uh, be flexible uh, in arrangements with those, those team members. And I know we're all doing that right now, but it may be more than just the typical sort of work from home. You may have to flex the deadlines. You may have to flex the timeframes. You may have to flex 
the amount of tasking. You may need to put uh, some tasks aside right now. And, uh, and I think that's really important. And, uh, you know, I guess the last thing is, is don't forget the basic need we all have for validation through this. And so if you can, and I know you can, you absolutely can, catch your team doing right. You know, when you see them doing well, when you see them working hard, celebrate and, and thank and, and constant appreciation. And I, I think that's basic for anyone who's in management, but let's be honest, at this time, we probably need it now more than ever. And I think a lot of that flows into this next topic, which is sort of communication strategies during crisis. Um, and thanks, Christelle, Dr. Hinshaw, thanks for reminding me of her name because her face is in front of me, but I just couldn't picture her name our chief medical officer here in Alberta, and, and she's just done so great, been so expert, so calming, and I'd rather listen to her than CNN anyways, you know, because she's great, no hype with her, and, uh, you know, honestly, uh, we're, we're kind of, I think, very fortunate to be in the province that we're in with the experts all throughout Alberta Health Services and our public health system, so uh, what about you, Connie, when it comes to communication strategies in, in a crisis? So, um, I think, the greatest thing, and I love, I love that uh, Dr. Hinshaw is remaining calm. Um, learning how to emotionally regulate so that everyone else around us can feel emotionally regulated too. So important, so key. Um, in communication, um, if you can do less texting and less emailing um, your, your team, so because of people's emotions are so high. And right now, um, people might say things that uh, are not full of grace and, and, and kindness um, because they're scared. And so learning how to look up at what is underneath what they're saying, I think is really going to be important right now. Um, we, we are so wired in our brains for connection. Um, we have mirror neurons, we copy one another. So if one person is speaking and they're super stressed, we, we pick up on that as humans. And so the more calm we can be, peace in my heart translates to peace everywhere else. Well, so that means I got to get grounded here first, which means again, like we've said, we've got to go back to ground zero in our own personal lives and make sure that, that we've got our boundary. I like what um, Sanishna, um, I hope I said your name right, uh, just was asking a question about boundaries really getting firm on, on what your boundary is right now, which means that you have to sit down with yourself, with your family and figure out what are my boundaries right now so I can remain emotionally regulated so that I can, I can be um, spreading peace right now when I speak instead of fear and aggravation and reaction. So communication right now really does need to be strategic. If if something is setting you off, if a text comes through and you're like, what did that person even mean? And we get a little upset. Taking 10 minutes, go, go walk around your house, go grab a coffee, just really allowing yourself to settle. Um, even questions that you may not have answers for. Really important right now to think about responses because people um, already statistically um, we're living 70% of our day in the back of our brain, that fight or flight. That's before this happened. Right now, people are very reactionary. People are fearful. They're living back here. So much of what comes out of our mouth reflects that. And so we can disarm people with just calm, firm, but kind, clear and kind. Um, that kind of communication, we can disarm and we can actually move and problem solve so much quicker with that kind of a uh, stance rather than constantly feeling like we have to respond to every email right away and we have to answer. Or if somebody says something really uh, aggravating, we come back with that same energy. We really have to be careful on those things right now. I love that, Connie. And I, uh, I'm just, you know, we're going we're gonna to kind of uh, close it out here in just a moment uh, because we, we do know that y'all have to get back. Uh, Connie and I, we're going to be doing this each week, but um, I don't want to tug on the heartstrings too much, but, uh, you know, um, what I've been trying to do is, uh, you know, I've been working from home. So I have an office office and I have a home office uh, with the kind of work that we do. And, 
you know, the good thing is the office office is, is vacated right now. So I can kind of come here when I want to alone, but I've been working from home because uh, my five-year-old daughter is also at home. And uh, though she has a caregiver, um, I've been uh, really uh, wanting to spend a bit of uh, time with her. And, and yet, you know, one of the things I want to say as a productivity hack is that, uh, and this is going to sound a little counterintuitive, but I mean, I could give you tons of productivity hacks. I think the best one was, uh, you know, from, uh, from uh, Vanessa with respect to using the, uh, uh, the sort of this journal idea, plan your day, uh, work your plan, and then evaluate. I do that all the time. But, you know, here's my, my, uh, my daughter, my five-year-old, and she came into my office uh, yesterday. And it was just the craziest thing because uh, she wanted to show me that she had a, a little suit jacket on. <laughs> and she's like, Daddy, I can, because, I, you know, obviously today I'm uh, more casual, but most of the time I wear a suit jacket to work. And she's like, I can come to work with you now whenever you're ready. And, uh, and you know, I, I just thought, you know, because... I'm investing in her, uh, that's actually making me more productive because when I took a couple of minutes with her and we just emotionally connected and of course uh, gave each other a little bit of love, you know, um, it was amazing because I was able to go back to work and be more productive because I wasn't sort of in this place where my focus was divided. And so I think with your kids, you know, or, or your loved ones, um, you know, the ones that you do have that physical closeness to, because you need to right now, maybe you're living together or whatever, uh, give a hug, give a handshake, give a, a warm embrace, connect with the people who matter. And I think what that's going to do is it's going to free up some mental real estate so that you can re-engage in the areas. So I think rather than sort of blocking time, I'm a big block timer, but I've been thinking a lot more about bursting, uh, time bursts, you know, so take an hour here, try to get a few things done and then give my daughter 15 minutes and then take another hour and then maybe take her for a walk, take another hour and then another 15 minutes. And what I'm actually finding is my, my mental real estate uh, is emotionally engaged. And I hope that that helps because, you know, we're all under stress right now. And, and my daughter doesn't cognitively understand what's going on, but we've explained to her about coronavirus. We've said, you got to basically wash your hands even when you're around the house every 20 minutes. And, and she can feel the stress, right? Because as parents, we're trying to explain my wife and I what's going on and she can hear the urgency in our voice. And so the more I'm just reconnecting with her, you know, I also have a 20 year old son and he lives on his own. And so, you know, I brought him a, a bag of groceries the other day because he's having a, a tough time with all of the food shortages. So, so I, I just think, you know, do what you can in those little areas. And uh, I think it's really going to help. And thanks for that uh, anonymous attendee love time burst. I think that's, uh, you know, just a way to think about it. And, 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 you know, back to what Connie said, uh, be gentle with yourself because, um, because you need it too. You know, I mean, as much as we love and support each other, we should, let's keep it up, but uh, love yourself, you know, and uh, for my wife last night, <laughs> uh, after a hard day, she's an IT. So uh, believe me, she's not working less. She's working more because she has to manage the transition of all of the people. Um, you, know, um, you know, for her, it was a glass of wine after a hard day. And, uh, you know, that's what works for her. You do what works for you. And so any final thoughts, um, Connie? And, and like Connie said, we will be back here next Wednesday between now and then, uh, we'd love to hear any comments or thoughts you have. Uh, Connie's going to make this available, uh, the recording of this. If you have comments or questions, we'll probably add another panelist next week as well uh, so that we can just diversify the thoughts and the conversation. I just think it makes it stronger. And so, Connie, uh, what do you think? Uh, yes, please uh, feel free to reach out in any way. Um, you can email me. Uh, you have my email, but if you don't, it's Connie at wellnessinnovate.com. Our website, wellnessinnovate.com is always there. Um, we, we really want to remind you right now that uh, inside of the human heart is a lot of courage and resilience. And so we, we want to leave you with the idea that to be strong and courageous as we navigate waters we've never been through. I mean, there's been times in history where all odds have been against humanity and we rise, you will rise. We will rise through this because 
inside of us, we have the ability to overcome. You are an overcomer. And so just wanted to speak that over you today and remind you of that on behalf of Abe and myself, because uh, in time, sometimes you just need to hear that. You are courageous. Keep being courageous. Keep leaning in and facing this head on. Amen, Crystal. Absolutely. So thanks so much, everybody, for taking your valuable time. And, uh, you know, it's 1246, so this seems like a great time to end it. And uh, for sure, we'll tune in next week. You guys are all amazing. And reach out, Connie, myself, any of us, uh, you know, and, and even if it's like basic needs, like we're, we don't have a, uh, an endless supply, but we'll do whatever we can to help you or get you connected to the right people. So thank you so much. All right, so we'll just uh, we'll just uh, we'll just stop the recording.